It's possible that Marvel might lose the rights to some of its most popular characters, Spider-Man, Black Widow, Thor, and Iron Man, among others. It's possible they might be ripped right out of the MCU because copyright is weird. But Marvel is being proactive. That's why they're going to court to stop the heirs of the creators of some of its most iconic characters from getting any royalties. With these lawsuits, Marvel is arguing that characters created by geniuses like Stan Lee are ineligible for copyright termination because they were works made for hire. In other words, since Lee was a Marvel employee, his estate is not entitled to any of the profits from future TV movies and merchandise. And Marvel makes the same argument against Steve Ditko, Gene Colan, and Larry Leiber, or their estates. Ditko, of course, is the reclusive legend who created Spider-Man with Stan Lee, Colin is the genius behind Daredevil, Falcon, Carol Danvers as Mrs. Marvel, and the cult satire, Howard the Duck. Liber drew newspaper strips of the Incredible Hulk and the Amazing Spider-Man and was instrumental in creating Iron Man. Marvel is still making movies and TV shows featuring these characters, and they are a big part of Disney's long-term plan. Well, maybe not Howard the Duck, at least not yet, but if that dog killer Cruella DeVille can get a favorable origin story, we know that Howard the Duck probably can't be too far behind. That's it. No more Mr. Nice Duck. But this is no small matter. If Marvel loses these lawsuits, its parent company, Disney, would have to share ownership of these characters that are worth billions of dollars. Hey, Legal Eagles, it's time to think like a copyright lawyer. So let's talk about why is Marvel suing the creators of some of its most famous characters and what's at stake? Well, let's take a look at what prompted Marvel to file these lawsuits. Steve Ditko was a renowned comic book artist who collaborated with Stan Lee to create Spider-Man and Doctor Strange. And unlikely, Ditko was a recluse who preferred to live in privacy, much like author J.D. Salinger. In his post-Marvel career, Ditko invented cult favorites like Squirrel Girl and wrote several comics featuring objectivist characters modeled on the philosophy of Ayn Rand. Ditko lived and worked alone in a Manhattan studio until his death at the age of 90 in 2018. Now, no one knows what Ditko worked on in his last years, but his last published words came in 2019. Quote, here's to those who wish me well, and those that don't can go to hell. And in this case, those who can go to hell might include Marvel and Disney. Oh dear, what an awkward situation. Now, this isn't always the case, but sometimes there are terminations provisions under copyright law where authors or their heirs can reclaim rights once granted to publishers after waiting a statutorily set period of time. Ditko's heirs in this case include his brother and his nephew. In August, his estate filed a notice of termination on Spider-Man. The Ditko termination notice demands that Marvel must relinquish Ditko's rights in Spider-Man by June of 2023. And there are termination provisions potentially at issue with a whole host of some of Marvel's most famous characters. So just what is a termination provision in US copyright law? Well, copyright termination is the termination of a grant or transfer of someone's copyright rights. And the Copyright Act of 1976 lengthened the term of copyright protection, giving copyright owners even more time to control and profit from their works of art. This was the major policy accomplishment of Congressman Sonny Bono, otherwise known as one half of Sonny and Cher. Yes, he did go on from the duo to hold office in Congress. And many people have either blamed or congratulated Disney on this extension of the copyright term. But note that not all copyright holders are the original creators of the art. For example, Paul McCartney co-wrote some of the most memorable songs ever written, but over the years, he sold or lost the copyright to that material. Most of the Beatles catalog is currently owned by Sony ATV, which acquired a good chunk of it from the estate of Michael Jackson, who famously purchased them for $47 million. Yeah, yeah. Do, do, yeah. In 2018, McCartney filed termination notices to reclaim those Beatles copyrights. Eventually, he settled with Sony ATV. A decision on the merits of that case would have been a landmark ruling, but both sides obviously felt there was too much to risk to proceed. And with the value of the Beatles publishing rights over $1 billion, there's plenty of money to go around. Now, creators can lose or voluntarily assign rights in a number of different ways, including just entering into a contract that seemed fair at the time, but in retrospect turned out to be very one-sided. Now, the amended Copyright Act therefore gave some artists the chance to get their copyrights back, provided that they lost their rights on or before January 1st, 1978. So the idea was that Congress is extending the copyright term. So if you had a copyright and then transferred it to somebody else before 1978, then you were allowed to claw back that copyright assignment or transfer many decades later. And now a lot of those terms are coming due. Following termination, any rights transferred under the grant come back to the person who created the copyrighted work. The purpose of this provision is to let authors, musicians, and illustrators, and other artists renegotiate the terms of their original contractual agreements. It basically gives artists a second chance to get a better deal. If the author is living, like Larry Leiber, they can file a termination notice at the appropriate time. Leiber is Stan Lee's little brother. He's responsible for co-creating Ant-Man, Thor, and Iron Man. Marvel is suing Leiber to stop him
them from terminating the Marvel copyrights to these characters. Or in other words, Marvel is going to court to say that in this situation, the termination provisions don't apply and the rights therefore don't have to go anywhere else. But not all rights return after a successful termination. Creators' American rights revert, but foreign rights, which are usually negotiated separately, do not return to the creator. Derivative works created under the authority of the grant before its termination can continue to be exploited. And as you can see, this is a more complex situation than it first appears. So let's dive into the Copyright Act provisions at stake, 17 U.S.C. 203 and 304. The first question that arises is which works are eligible for termination. Although most grants of copyright rights can be terminated, some grants are excluded. Since the termination provisions are meant to give the author a second chance, if the author is still living and the original grants were made by somebody else, these grants can't be terminated. If the author is living, grants made by anyone other than certain statutory heirs are also ineligible for termination. The list of individuals is included in section 304. And the act also excludes grants made by will. So if an author died 50 years ago and granted their copyrights to someone by will, that person's heirs can't attempt to revoke the grant under the section. Additionally, and this is the big one, the Copyright Act's termination provisions do not apply to works made for hire. A work made for hire has a complicated definition, but generally speaking, if you're employed when you make something that could be copyrighted, it's your employer who gets the copyright to that thing. It's not the employee who made that thing while being employed by somebody else. And if a work is made for hire, an employer is considered the author even if the employee actually created the work. The employer can be a firm, an organization, or an individual. This is a very contentious part of the law for comic book creators, many of whom were actually employees when they created their characters. And determining whether something is a work for hire is challenging and depends on the facts of each particular situation. Now, there are some complications in when a termination notice needs to be provided. I won't bore you with the details, but it generally has to fall within a five-year termination period. And here, the Marvel cases mostly involve grants executed before January 1st, 1978. And in addition to the timing, there are tons of procedural issues like co-ownership, a majority of the co-owners have to agree. There are lots and lots of procedural issues here that are extremely boring and have no place in a 15 minute YouTube video. And other creators have filed termination notices as well. They tend to be represented by attorney Mark Toberoff, the lawyer who represented Superman creators Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster in their ultimately unsuccessful termination attempt against DC Comics. Now, under some circumstances, a would-be defendant can go into court and get the court to adjudicate the issue before everything goes crazy. And that's what Marvel has done here. Marvel has filed suit against the creators, alleging that they were all employees and that the works that they created were considered works for hire and thus not subject to copyright termination. Marvel is asking federal courts in New York and California to issue declaratory judgments, blocking the termination notices and affirming that Disney is the sole owner of these characters. So you might see headlines that Disney is suing the owners and it sounds nefarious, but there's really nothing wrong with it. They're adjudicating this case early early, and while Disney would normally be the defendant in an action like this, uh, they're really just going to the court to adjudicate exactly the same things that they would if the creators were the ones that were suing Disney. Now, a lot of this litigation is going to turn on the definition of a work made for hire. That's defined by Section 101 of the Copyright Act, which defines a work made for hire in two parts. It can be either A, a work prepared by an employee within the scope of his or her employment, or B, a work specially ordered or commissioned for use as a contribution to a collective work, as part of a motion picture or other audiovisual work, as a translation, as a supplementary work, as a compilation, as an instructional test, as a test, as an answer material for a test, or as an atlas if the parties expressly agree in a written instrument signed by them that the work shall be considered a work made for hire. Now the Supreme Court has interpreted a work for hire in the famous case of CCNV versus Reed. Now in that case, the Community for Creative Nonviolence made an oral agreement with James Reed, a sculptor, to produce a statue depicting the plight of the homeless for display in a 1985 Washington DC Christmas pageant. After the sculpture was completed and delivered, CCNV paid Reed in full. Shortly after that, both parties filed separate and competing copyright claims over the sculpture. A lower court held that the sculpture was a work made for hire. And after the Second Circuit reversed the decision, it went all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court ruled for Reed, the sculptor, holding that the court must first ascertain whether the work was prepared by an employee or an independent contractor. If an employee created the work, part one of the definition that we talked about applies and the work will generally be considered a work made for hire because it was made within the scope of that person's employment. But this gets more complicated because the term employee in the definition differs from the common understanding of the term. For purposes of the Copyright Act, an employee means an employee under the general common law of agency. If an independent contractor created the work, then the work was specially ordered or commissioned. Part two of the definition applies. And an independent contractor is someone
someone who was not an employee under the general common law of agency. And the Supreme Court created four factors to determine whether someone is an employee under purposes of the Copyright Act. I won't bore you with those definitions, but you can actually read it in CCNV versus read. It's actually a pretty understandable court decision as those things go. But in this litigation, it will probably focus on what's called the Marvel Method, which is a quote, loose collaborative working atmosphere where initial ideas were briefly discussed with artists responsible for taking care of the details. Marvel characterizes this as a traditional employer-employee relationship. And Marvel argues that any contributions that Steve Ditko, for example, made were at Marvel's instance and expense. Marvel editorial staff had the right to exercise creative control over Steve Ditko's contributions, and Marvel paid Steve Ditko a per page rate for his contributions. When Steve Ditko worked for Marvel, he did so with the expectation that Marvel would pay him. Moreover, Marvel says that its editorial staff had the right to exercise creative control over Steve Ditko's contributions. Quote, any contributions Steve Ditko made to the works were done at Marvel's expense because Marvel paid Steve Ditko a per page rate for his contributions. Steve Ditko made those contributions to the works with the expectation that Marvel would pay him, and Steve Ditko did not obtain any ownership interest in or to his contributions. And Marvel made the same arguments in the other lawsuits as well. And the representatives of the comic book creators will make the same legal arguments that Jack Kirby did over a decade ago when Kirby and Marvel litigated the issue of whether Kirby could terminate a copyright grant on Spider-Man, X-Men, The Incredible Hulk, and Mighty Thor. In 2013, the Second Circuit Court of Appeals affirmed a lower court ruling that Kirby's heirs could not terminate the copyright over those characters since Kirby had contributed his materials as a work made for hire. Kirby tried to appeal to the Supreme Court, arguing that he was essentially a freelancer, not an employee. Kirby didn't receive any benefits or fixed salary, nor did Marvel reimburse him for his expenses. Kirby also worked from home, and although this would seem to suggest that he was an independent contractor, the Second Circuit saw the situation differently. Quote, despite the absence of a formal employment agreement, however, the record suggests that Kirby and Marvel were closely affiliated during the relevant time period. Lee assigned Kirby, whom he considered his best artist, a steady stream of work during that period. And Kirby seems to have done most of his work with Marvel projects in mind. The Second Circuit emphasized that the key factor is whether a work is made at the hiring party's instance and expense. And that happens when the employer induces the creation of the work and has the right to direct and supervise the manner in which the work is carried out. The Second Circuit acknowledged that Kirby's, quote, working relationship with Marvel between the years of 1958 and 1963 was close and continuous and continued, quote, understood as products of the overarching relationship, Kirby's works during this period were hardly self-directed projects in which he hoped Marvel as one of several potential publishers might have an interest. Rather, he created the relevant works pursuant to Marvel's assignment or with Marvel's specifically in mind. Kirby's ongoing partnership with Marvel, however unbalanced and under remunerative, to the artist is therefore what induced Kirby's creation of the works. It's believed that Kirby had a looser agreement with Marvel than many other artists, including Lee. And when the Supreme Court declined to accept the appeal from the Kirby case, the parties settled. And since the ruling only applied to two of Kirby's four children, the others lived in California, Marvel opted to settle with the family rather than face more litigation. So this probably means that Marvel has the edge because of this published Second Circuit ruling. In the current cases, Marvel argues that the Kirby case is dispositive and that the courts must rule in its favor. However, the ultimate issue of whether the Marvel method of producing comics means that the creators were employed still hasn't been decided by the Supreme Court. And one of the most important factors in determining whether you are an employee or an independent contractor is whether your employer provides you with the tools you need for the job. And if your employer doesn't give you a cell phone, you can save a ton of money on your cell phone bill with today's sponsor, Ting Mobile. In fact, I personally switched Ting Mobile and saved literally hundreds of dollars a month. I'm not kidding about that. Why? Well, because of this. Yes, this is a real cell phone bill that I got with my previous provider, and that's why I personally switched to Ting. And Ting Mobile has three brand new plans to make sure that that never happens again. All of Ting's plans have unlimited talk and text starting at just $10 per month, so you can use the Flex plan and only pay for what you use, which is especially great if you're around Wi-Fi all day. You can choose a set of 12 gigabyte of data for $35 or get full unlimited for $45 a month. Switching plans is actually really easy because you can keep your same phone number and use pretty much any phone. And the service is great too because Ting partners with several massive of networks, probably the very same one that you're using right now, but at a huge discount. They literally use the same infrastructure. Now, I actually can't tell you which ones because I always respect contracts, but let's just say that my service hasn't changed at all. And you get the benefit of other massive networks as well. And if you're around Wi-Fi all the time, like you're working from home, you have the flexibility to save hundreds of dollars a year. That's because Ting still gives you the option to just pay for what you use with their flex plan. Now they just give you the possibility of unlimited versions as well. So if you want unlimited, you can go absolutely crazy. And it's incredible easy to transfer service. All you have to do is just 
order a Ting SIM card, pop it in and set it up. No phone calls are required, it's like magic. But if you do wanna to talk to Ting, you can call them up and immediately talk to a real human being or you can talk to them on chat or Discord. You'll talk to real human beings, not AI robots. Virtually no wait times because they don't have brick and mortar stores. They pour it all into their customer service. Now, if you'd like to give Ting a try, Legal Eagles will get a free $25 service credit that could cover two months of service. All you have to do is click on the link below and give it a try. You can even use your last bill to compare just how much you would save. All you have to do is click on the link that's on screen right now. Plus, clicking on that link really helps out this channel. And while you're there, check out this playlist with all my other real law reviews on the most important legal issues of the day. So click on this playlist or I'll see you in court.